The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Welcome to our worship at Christ Church of Longboat Key on this Easter Sunday morning. Whether you're with us in the sanctuary or whether you're watching the live streaming of the service at home, we're delighted to have you with us, sharing in the joy that is at the very heart of our Christian faith. Welcome, one and all, to our worship. If you're visiting with us today, we bid you a particularly warm welcome. We're delighted to have you here. I'm sorry that because we're all masked, we can't uh, recognize who are the visitors, who are the regulars, but please be assured of a very warm welcome. And I'm sorry we've had to seat you the way we've done, but uh, we're still trying to keep everybody as safe as possible. And just in case you're wondering why these people behind me don't stand to sing during the service, They're not our choir. They're just members of the congregation who have agreed to sit up here to make more seating available down there. And I'm with you. I, I think it is terrible that we can't sing today on Easter Sunday. I want to. I want to get hoarse when it comes to the final hymn in our worship today. But again, we want to be safe, and we're blessed that Maddie and Robert uh, will be singing, and Brad will be keeping the, uh, the, the, the rhythm up with the sound of the trumpet, and Jeremy will be thundering away on the organ. Come back next year, and we'll blow the roof off this place with our Easter joy. But for this year, we'll behave ourselves. I hope you saw the announcements uh, on the screens before the service began uh, or that you received them uh, by email uh, last Thursday when our secretary sent out the information about today and the order of service. If you're visiting and you would like to stay connected with Christ Church, give us your email address. We'll add you to our mailing list. You can get Thursday by Thursday information about the life of the church and also the order of service for Sunday morning. And if you are interested in making a closer connection with Christ Church of Longboat Key, and really, I, I can say this because it has little to do with me. We are blessed with a wonderful fellowship of believers here at Christ Church. Leave your name at the welcome desk or email Kathy in the church office and someone will follow up. We would be delighted to encourage your association with this community of faith. Enough from me. We are here, at least enough from me at the moment. <laughs> we are here, friends, to worship God on this most glorious of days. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Yeah. 
come in faith to make confession to our God. Let us pray together. God of Easter, giver of joy and laughter, in the resurrection of Jesus, you opened up to us your new creation. Forgive us that we are so reluctant to receive it. We are comfortable with our daily routines, even when they're painful and hesitate to trust the power of new beginnings, even when they're joyful. We live by knowledge and experience and resist the gifts of faith and hope. Forgive us, loving God. As you overcame all human expectation in the resurrection of our Lord, so break through our fears and hesitations and make us glad and joyful believers, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Friends, the God who raised Jesus from the dead loves us, forgives us, and calls us to his new creation. Oh 
the things we are grateful for in Christ Church is the faithfulness of God's people in continuing their support for the church and their contributions to our revenue stream. And so, although we don't take up an offering during worship, there are plates at the door as you leave, uh, and although many people uh, use that method, many others uh, send checks or give online, and because all our giving represents an expression of our faith in Jesus Christ, we dedicate all these gifts in our worship time. Let us pray. Risen Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being your people and living in the joy of Easter faith. We thank you for the way that joy encourages your people to give of time, of talents, and of generosity. And we bless you for every gift by which the work of your church on earth is sustained. And in the life of the world, amid these difficult challenges that surround us, we thank you for all who give in any way to help, to heal, to reassure, and to bless. Lord, as you gave us all in Christ, so bless the giving which your people seek to render, and let it redound to your glory and your praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Isaiah 25, 6 through 9, a promise of God's salvation. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations, he will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Amen. Our second reading is from Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8, Easter in the earliest gospel, stark, dramatic, unexpected. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If this were a normal Easter Sunday, I'd invite all the girls and boys in church to come forward and we'd chat for a few minutes about the wonder of the Easter story that Robert has just read for us. But because we're trying to play safe and keep everybody safe, I'll just ask you girls and boys to stay in your seats. But we are delighted that you are here. It's always fun to have young people with us in worship. And actually, would you, would you all just, where you're sitting now, will you all please just stand? 
Just where you are. That's right. Just stand up. Don't worry. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. Just stand up. And if you're very... Come on. <laughs> if you're very, very small, either get gran or grandpa or mom or dad to pick you up and hold you. We just want to see where all the children are in church. I know some of you are pretending no longer to be children, but <laughs> let's welcome them because we are delighted to have them here. And you can complain to me at the door afterwards. Normally, as I say, we bring the girls and boys forward. And a few years ago, we did just that. And I told the girls and boys about the Easter story and about the significance of our Easter eggs and how they were originally given to us because we were supposed on Easter Sunday to roll the egg to remember from the story that the stone at the tomb where Jesus had been laid had been rolled away. Now, it would be a pretty mean pastor to talk about Easter eggs if he didn't actually have some Easter eggs to give out. So, I had some Easter eggs to share with the girls and boys who were here. And suddenly, this young, this big boy, young man, I don't know which he was, who'd been sitting at the back of the church, who did not come forward with everybody else, suddenly came forward for an Easter egg. And I thought, hey, that's not a bad move. And so I gave him one. Because what he did, in a sense, was say, I want to be part of this. I want to share in the celebration of Easter, even if it's just a celebration that includes a little chocolate Easter egg. Give me one, please. Count me in. And that is something that lies at the heart of the Easter story. In all the Gospels, the women who were at the tomb were told, go and tell his disciples. Share the good news that God has raised Jesus from the dead and by doing so has assured us that God's love is eternal. And so, the boy who wanted to be included in the Easter story reminded me that Easter is a story that we want to include everybody in. We want everyone to know that God loves them, that God cares for them, and that through the power of God Almighty, even though we die, that's not the end of the story, because God can raise us to eternal life with Jesus. And that's the reason we are here, that's the joy we share on Easter Sunday. And as I said at the beginning, it would be a pretty mean pastor who spoke about chocolate Easter eggs and didn't have any to share with the girls and boys in church. So when you leave this morning, my wife will be at the door with a basket of Easter eggs. Make sure she gives you one. I'm hoping she doesn't give you too many because I get to eat all those that are left. <laughs> but make sure you get one, because just as you're here sharing in worship, we want you to share in the wonderful news that God loves each one of us. Let's have a little prayer, and I'll say a few words, and I'll invite the girls and boys and the grown-up teenagers too to join in saying it with me. Let us pray. Thank you, loving God. Thank you, loving God, for the joy of Easter for the joy of Easter and the good news that Jesus is alive and the good news that Jesus is alive. Help us to trust, help us to trust that you will never let us go, that you will never let us go, but love us always, but love us always for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now our special music.
Yes, that's the kind of music to affirm the joy we feel on Easter Day when we acknowledge the center of our faith, that the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. And that's why we're here in church, to celebrate the joy of Easter, to get together and have some joy, some celebration, some good news at last. We've lived with all the fears that COVID has brought for far too long, and we want rid of them. We need an Easter celebration to put these fears behind us and move to get our lives back to normal. And yet, when Mark tells the Easter story, he injects a note of fear. He ends his gospel with verse 8. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And you think, no thanks. Enough with being afraid. We came to church for Easter joy. What's this all about? Well, we are right to come to church for Easter joy, because Easter is joy. But I don't think we'll fully understand the joy of Easter unless we take on board the truth that Mark is trying to tell us here. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And curiously enough, there's an article in today's New York Times that makes that very point. The article's titled, The Unsettling Power of the Easter Story. And Esau Macaulay, who's a professor of New Testament at Billy Graham's old school, Wheaton College in Illinois, has written, Mark's ending points to a truth that often gets lost in the celebration, Easter is a frightening prospect. For the woman, the only thing more terrifying than a world with Jesus dead was one in which Jesus is alive. Now, I don't know who told Macaulay that that was the line I was going to take this morning, but I was grateful to see it affirmed in the pages of the paper. The woman had gone to the tomb early that Sunday morning to do the kind of thing that we do when we take flowers to the grave, a final act of caring, the ending of a chapter, a normal kind of thing. And then their normal was upended. He has been raised. He is not here. Go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee, and you will see him there as he has told you. 
And then Mark adds, they fled. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. How so? I find Mark's Greek subtle here. In ancient Greek language, there were two ways of saying no. You could say no gently in conversational terms. As in, Norman, would you like a third piece of carrot cake? Um, no thanks, I'd better not. Or you could scream no emphatically at the top of your voice, the way we do when we receive terrible news. And we scream, no, no way, this can't be happening, don't you dare. That kind of no. If Mark had used that kind of no, and the woman really had told nobody anything, block capitals, bold, underlined, then the deal was over. The story is dead. Easter would never have gotten out of the garden into the world. But Mark uses the first the softer option, more everyday language. And I think all he really meant was no time for chit-chat. Don't stop to speak to neighbors on the way. Get this news to the disciples and to Peter. And obviously, the story did get out, and Easter did get into the world, so the women obviously did tell the disciples and Peter, as indeed the other Gospels tell us that they did. But I think that as they ran from the tomb, they were hit by the first of the fears that gripped them. They were afraid of being laughed at. I mean, think about it. The story was so incredible. The woman had been there at Calvary on Good Friday and had seen Jesus buried, laid on the tomb. How is anyone going to believe them when they say he is now alive? It is an astonishing story. And they were afraid they wouldn't be believed. And in fact, the Gospels tell us, Matthew, Luke, and John, they were laughed at. Luke tells us that when the disciples heard, they were astounded by the story. They regarded it as an idle tale which they did not believe. And then John's gospel gives us the unfairly dubbed doubting Thomas. And the very last thing that Matthew tells us as Jesus gave his disciples the great commission to go into all the world, Matthew tells us there were still some who doubted. Still today, and not just disciples. If you read Macaulay's article online, go to the comments section. There's lots of warm appreciation and affirmation there, but you'll also find the skeptics and the critics giving voice to their spleen. They talk about things like fairy tales, fantasy, and with a sneer, alleged supernatural events, reminding us of just how counterintuitive the Easter story is, and just how challenging it is for believers today to affirm. The news was so good that the women were able to overcome their fears. We have the benefit later of having a risen Lord who lives in believers' hearts and can offer encouragement and support and sustenance and strength when we need it. 
Karen Thiel is a clinical psychologist in New York. She was recently interviewed for an article for philosopher George Yancey. Yancey does not believe in God, and he was exploring faith issues for his article. And he asked Karen Thiel if she, as a clinical psychologist, didn't share Stephen Hawking's view that faith in a God who brings life out of death is a fairy tale for people afraid of the dark. Teal didn't hesitate. She told of nursing her mother through the unrelenting decay of ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And she told Yancey, before facing my mother's death, I never really knew that I believed that life continues. But in caring for my mother, I've discovered that I know it. As I know the sun will come up in the morning, as I know I'll get wet in the rain, as I know I love my own children, it isn't about fear. It's a gift and a mystery, the conviction that we come from love and return to love. You see, Easter tells us of a risen Savior who is with us in the love deep enough to die for us and who seeks to journey alongside us as a living presence to strengthen and sustain and hold us in the assurance that Easter means that death has been defeated. Which leads me to the woman's second fear. The Gospels frankly acknowledge that Jesus' arrest threw his disciples into disarray. They all forsook him and fled. They ran for their lives from the garden. And even on the evening of that first Easter, John's gospel tells us they were cowering behind locked doors, gripped by fear. We can understand that. The authorities had executed the leader of the group, a mop-up operation of his followers was not impossible. And everyone knew that the Romans had plenty crosses to spare. So fear of the authorities and death that they could impose was very real. And I just love what happens next. Nothing. If I'd been writing the story, if I'd been creating a fictional gospel, I would have put in at this point instant bravado, immediate faith-filled defiance. I'd have a superhero disciple stand up on Easter Monday and shout resurrection from the rooftop. didn't happen. It took several weeks, days and days of time with the risen Jesus, time for reflection, for restoration, for reorientation, and for the reassurance that their master still believed in them and trusted them to take his message to the world. Only then, thoroughly prepared, did Peter and the rest take on the world. And their fears were not invalid. The world was not impressed. The authorities resented what they tried to do. And very soon, they made their resentment real in harassment, in persecution, in imprisonment, and then finally death. And when the Christian gospel spread, 
and began to be seen as a power with which the Roman Empire was uncomfortable. Persecution began in serious ways. And yet, and yet we're here today. Here is a truth to chase our fears away. The followers of Jesus were persecuted. They were killed, have been across the centuries, throughout the world. And for all that in history, Christians have done terrible things. Christians have also had terrible things done to them. And none of that has stopped the faith. It's true. You probably saw the report last week. The comforts of our modern world and the greedy individualism of our angry culture do not offer fertile soil for Christian growth in today's America. But Jesus lives. His faith spreads across the world, and ultimately nothing will stop it. I cherish the words that the great Catholic theologian Hans Kung once wrote. Whatever the reason for it, the fact deserves careful consideration that after the fall of so many gods, this person, broken at the hands of his opponents and constantly betrayed throughout the ages by his adherents, is obviously still for innumerable people the most moving figure in the long history of humankind. Unusual and incomprehensible in many ways. He is the hope of revolutionaries and evolutionaries. He fascinates intellectuals and anti-intellectuals. He requires the capable and the incapable he constantly stimulates theologians and even atheists to think again. None of the great founders of religion lived in so restricted an area. None lived for such a terribly short time. None died so young. And yet, how great his influence has been every fourth human being, about a thousand million human beings are called Christians. Across the world today, in stunning ways, our risen Lord is living still and working through His people. And for all the bad press that Christianity has, not always unfairly, garnered. It is still a fact of history that many of the developments the world has seen and much of the social progress in the world has happened thanks to Jesus living in the lives of His people and ministering through them. Amid all the anger, the divisiveness, amid the shaming and the name-calling of America today, we need to ask ourselves, do we still harbor fear that all that Jesus stands for doesn't cut it in our day? Well, go back to Esau Macaulay, this time thanks to an article a couple of weeks ago now by David Brooks. Brooks wrote that as someone who wants to advocate for social justice, as someone who's concerned with all that's wrong in America today. He wanted to write about it, but found it hard to do so without giving in to anger, to prejudice, to self-righteousness. And then he interviewed this New Testament professor who described a distinctly Christian vision of social justice which David Brooks says he found riveting and a little strange in a good way. 
and important for everybody to hear, Christian and non-Christian, believer and non-believer. This begins with respect for the equal dignity of every person, based on the Christian idea that we are made in the image of God. And that vision demolishes all the social barriers that we erect. Christianity should spell the death of racism and discrimination. But then Brooks went on that Macaulay's vision also emphasizes memory. Memory of the progress that the human race has accomplished, however halting and vulnerable it may be, but also acknowledgement of past mistakes, of terrible injustices, of naked sin. And Brooke says, sin's a very helpful context, a issue to, to bring in in this context because sin makes it possible to engage an action plan. Confession, forgiveness, changed behavior, reconciliation by word and deed. And this action plan is such that no one need be excluded. Such a Vision does not put anyone outside the sphere of possible redemption. Macaulay says, when the church is at its best, it opens up to the possibility of change to begin again. Wow. Catch the underlying truth. The message of Jesus is true to human experience. Jesus works. What Jesus stands for meets our modern need and heals our modern hurts. And here's the big thing. God raised Jesus from the dead. Easter is only possible because God acted, because of God's affirmation of Jesus and God's endorsement of Jesus and His words, His ministry, His grace, His love his reconciliation. And the God who has raised Jesus from the dead trusts Jesus' people with the privilege of carrying on in that way. Friends, Easter's not a theory. It's eternal truth. Easter isn't only then and there. It's also here and now. A new chapter has been opened. Jesus is alive. Our fears are groundless. He is with us always to the end of time. Let us pray. Lord, make it Easter in our hearts and chase away our fears and help us by our faithful living to take Easter to the world and bring our Savior's healing grace to all the hurts that spoil your good creation for your triumphant love's sake. Amen.
I invite you now to affirm the faith that unites us in Christ. Please just remain seated as we join together in the words of the ecumenical version of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, we follow Jesus' example from the upper room. He took bread and wine and shared them with his disciples after giving thanks to God. So let us offer God our thanks and our praise. Let us pray. The darkness has been pierced by light, dear God. The sorrow comforted, defeat defeated, death overpowered. It is Easter. Jesus is alive. Come to us, dear Lord, in all your risen glory, that we might hear you call our names, that we might now on this most glorious day of joy be still and know that you are God. We give you heartfelt thanks for Easter joy that floods our hearts. Thank you for your Easter promise and your Easter presence. Thank you that in a world needing Easter, you can enter through locked doors and reach those people locked by hurt, by loneliness and grief. Thank you that your power to heal brings hope to those oppressed by addiction, hunger, or poverty. Thank you that your all-inclusive love is strong enough to break down barriers, erase the differences that divide us, and gift us with a new community in which the love of God is known to cherish every living soul. Thank you for the truth your risen life proclaims, that sin has been defeated, death undone. Thank you for the hope that the pain of defeat and the grief of loss and any fear of the future have had their power over us removed. And we are free in the privilege of being daughters and sons of God Most High, in whose love we are secure. And now we join in Jesus' words, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you're not used to our little communion utensils, which we use purely for safety's sake, there is a little tab at the top, which if you pull it will reveal a little wafer, which will serve as our communion bread, and then a second tab will uh, open up the little cup of grape juice. Uh, in both cases, we will have a just brief prayer before we partake both of the bread and the wine. Friends, we do this in remembrance of Jesus, who the night he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we pray, 
bread of the world, in mercy broken, by you the words of life were spoken. Speak to our hearts, receive our praise, and journey with us through these days. Amen. And we do this now in remembrance of him. In the same way, Jesus took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And as we share the cup, we pray, Jesus, true and living vine, Lord of mercy, grace divine, sustained by you we seek to live. Your grace, your mercy, Lord, now give. And now together we pray. Lord Jesus Christ, life overcoming death, love defeating enmity, grace covering all our sins, grant us the grace to live in your way, the love to overcome the obstacles we face, and life made more abundant by the power of your indwelling spirit. We pray in your precious, victorious name. Amen. For the dying and undying love of our Savior Jesus Christ, 
in your great goodness, you have brought us into communion with him and with all who love him and made us heirs of your eternal kingdom. By your grace, may we continue in this holy fellowship and live to the glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen this morning.